Debbie. Well, good morning, church. It is so glad to be back with you here this Sunday. I'm so thankful for Kevin and the team as they led worship last week. I tell you what, it is amazing. I don't know how many of you can relate to this. If you've been, if you miss one Sunday at church, doesn't it feel like you've been gone three or four? Yeah, you're you're with me. Okay. Well, I'm I'm not totally with it because it feels like that's the case this morning, but. Nonetheless, I'm so glad that you all are here this morning, and if you're visiting with us, my name is Kevin. I'd like to welcome you to Heartland Christian Church this morning. As we start our service this morning, I would ask that you please stand with us as we begin by singing praises to the one who gave it all, singing, Holy is the Lord. We stand and lift up our hands. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He! And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. with me. Almighty Father, I pray this morning as we come before you and bow down and worship you now that our hearts will be humble and we will give all of our worries unto you this morning as we as we come to the foot of your cross this morning. Father, I pray that you would be with us. I pray that you would um, put a special blessing upon this service as we pour our hearts out and hear a message from your word here this morning. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus and this beautiful day that you've blessed us with to worship you. And it's in your son's name I ask all these things. Amen. You may be seated. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom. Oh, 
to meet around the Lord's table this morning. Would you please stand with us as we sing this beautiful hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. No. 
You ever have one of them nights when... Mm. Yep. You ever have one of them nights where when whatever you had planned for today, something just told you it was about to change. Uh, so I wrestled all night with this. So this is what I come up with today. And Kevin, it couldn't, I don't think, hit better with your sermon. I titled it The State of the Heart. When we look throughout the Bible, we find several states of the heart that are mentioned. One of the first states of the heart was found in the book of Exodus, where we find Pharaoh's heart was hard. He saw all of God's miracles, yet he refused to believe in God. We move on to the New Testament, and we find in Acts 2, 36 through 38, here we find mentioned a pierced heart, a broken heart yearning to be made right. It's written there, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So then, after their baptism and receiving forgiveness, and the Holy Spirit, we find that they have a heart tuned to God, tuned with God. I have a question. Just, does the Christian still commit sin? Sure we do. As long as we're in this physical body and, when, and, and we're in this physical world, we're going to be tempted, and we do, sin. The only difference is we are one of God's children now. And that being the difference is that God's grace now forgives, continues to forgive us when we fail. So does that mean then that we can go on sinning and still receive more forgiveness? No. Paul tells us in Romans 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2, Romans 6, verses 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So we make every effort to avoid sinning, but when we do, that's why I think Christ instituted the Lord's Supper. It's to remind us that his broken body and his shed blood was given to continually cover our sins if we repent and try to do better. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So when we meet around these emblems, we're here to examine ourselves, not our neighbors. 
It's a time for you to have a conversation with God, a time to ask for forgiveness where you failed and sinned, a time to say, I can do better and mean it. But as Christians, we have to be very careful that the sin in our lives doesn't become willful sin. What I mean by that is we know it's sin and we do it anyway. In, in other words, we make a habit of it. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, Paul says, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So as we meet around these emblems, we need to have a heart of worship. A heart that says, not my will, Lord, but yours. Would you bow with me? We thank you, God, for this forgiveness that you've given us, this gift of your son to die in our place, a sacrifice for our sins, not his. A sacrifice, Father, that takes the sin from our lives and allows us to be able to stand before you in judgment day. We look forward to that day, but until then, may we be found around this table honoring you and your son for the gift of this salvation that you've given to us. Bless this cup and this loaf as we partake. And it's in Jesus' name we ask it all. Thank you, Devin, for those great words. Uh, your your efforts that uh, God put on your heart paid off. That was great. Thank you. As the kids head out for Kids on Worship, I just have a few announcements um, this morning. Just remember our five loaves and two fish finish, uh, ministry uh, is still going to be collecting mac and cheese throughout the month of January. So you have two more weeks, well, today and next Sunday, to bring those in. So uh, we get to, we'd uh, appreciate that as you are uh, bringing those in, and the folks of The Promise really appreciate that. Our Wednesday night Bible studies that Kevin is leading, um, those are starting back up, and um, they'll start at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights. Uh, those are very worthy. If, uh, if you haven't been a part of that, I would encourage you to come to that. So uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Kevin, and hopefully his microphone. Was that his microphone doing that, Matt? This one was. It was off. This one was oh. off until I turned it on. And that one was off. That was off too. Was it the was it his handheld mic? Oh, okay. Well, you should be good. Oh, okay. <laughs> good morning. I do want to. Uh, uh, Kevin didn't realize this, but we've been talking uh, as far as our Wednesday night. Uh, sometimes the numbers and things are still kind of getting out of hand, so we kind of decided to go ahead and lay off of Wednesday night Bible study until the first of March. Give it a little bit more time. There are still some people who. Uh, who aren't coming that normally come to Wednesday night Bible study, others who would like to, but with all this COVID and Omicron and all this stuff that's going on, we're going to give it a little bit more time, okay? So the first of March, we'll try to kick that off the first Wednesday of March, whatever that is, but we'll make sure that, that we let everybody know. So just continue to keep that uh, in your prayers uh, as well. We definitely would appreciate it. I've got a couple of cards I want to share with you this morning. Brothers and sisters of Heartland Christian Church, we thank you so much for the prayers, cards, and plant you sent to us for our mother during her illness and death. I am blessed to have a loving uh, church family. May our Heavenly Father bless each and every one of you. In his name, Wanda and Albert Noble. Well, let's continue to remember them, if you will, in our prayers, too. Heartland Christian Church family, Thank you for all of the prayers, the phone calls, and text messages while I was in the hospital. Uh, it will be a, a slow recovery process, but I am putting my faith and trust in God. May God bless you. Thank you, Dave Trumbly. Dave, it's good to see you here with us, too. I'm glad that you're doing okay. 
uh, Debbie Land, she was sick last Sunday. She's here. It's good to see the James family back with us. And Lori, it's good to see good to see you. You've been in our prayers as well. But we've got a lot of people that we need to continue to keep on our prayers that are dealing through, uh, going through difficult situations, whether it's sickness or uh, just life, just life. We need to keep them in, in prayer. Uh, I talked to my sister Deborah this morning, and she had the, the heart calf, and uh, she came through that and is doing well. She had uh, one area that was like 30% blocked, but I guess they weren't able to do anything with that. Uh, but she's been having uh, like chest pains that have been going up to her jaw, which is not a good thing, and they don't quite have that figured out. Uh, but evidently that has something to do with the heart. Uh, we've got the heart situation on both sides of our family, and so far I've been, been okay <laughs> with that, but uh, my parents and both of my sisters uh, have had heart problems and procedures as well. So uh, my brother Kim and his fiance Pam, I talked to Pam yesterday, and those two are coming, uh, coming through their uh, uh, COVID pretty well too. So continue to keep all these in your prayers. I would appreciate it. Devin, thank you uh, for that communion meditation. Uh, some of the things that Devin shared kind of go along with the message that I want to share here this morning entitled Walking in His Will. Walking in His Will. I ran across, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a poem, but it's uh, kind of a little song too. Uh, it's kind of one of the earlier contemporary songs that was written many, many years ago. And uh, it's short, but uh, it gives us a lot of uh, food for thought. It's a challenge to all of us who are Christians, and it goes like this. Can he depend on you, his blessed will to do? Will you be crowned with the faithful and true? Can he depend on you? Throughout the message, I want us to think about this little song or this little poem in light of what's, what it's asking from each and every one of us. You know, uh, we're going to be, if you want to go ahead, those of you brought your Bibles, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, 1 through 13, as well as looking at some other passages as well this morning. You know, for many people, many Christians, after they become a believer in Jesus Christ, they, they kind of have this question, what next? You know, what, 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 is, what does God mean for my life? What direction should I be going next? Uh, do I continue to go to church and then wait and go to heaven? You know, I hate to say it, but some Christians are like that. You know, I'm attending church, but in between that time, I'm just kind of biding my time and, you know, waiting to go to heaven. But we know, we know there's a whole lot more to our existence as brothers and sisters in Christ than just that. Amen? Okay, well, we'll think about that here in, in just a moment. And I got thinking maybe why, why is one of the reasons that people struggle for their identity in Christ? So let me ask you something. How many of you, when you became a Christian, were discipled? A few of you were discipled. You were kind of brought along, brought along in the faith. Uh, really, you know, the church ought to have, and I know it's kind of the situation we're in, but a discipling class. You know, now that I'm a Christian, uh, kind of gearing and guiding uh, these young Christians in the life that they've been called to. And as you have just shared with me, many of you weren't. But many of you probably stayed within the confines of the church. You went to, you know, Wednesday night Bible study. You had Sunday school. You had all of those uh, to kind of bring you up in the faith. How many of you had a mentor that helped you in your Christian walk? Mary, anybody? Okay, Beth, some of you had, uh, had a, a mentor. So very, very, very important that we have those. And, and, and uh, let me reiterate here. I know we're kind of uh, unable to do some of the things that we've normally done here at Heartland as far as providing uh, Sunday school and, and even now Wednesday night we've got to hold back on it and one thing or another. Uh, but I would advise, I would advise those are some good fellowship times, good times of learning, good times of growing in the Word of God and in our faith. Amen? If you've ever, if you've ever participated in those, you know how beneficial they can be. So my prayer is for each of us, whenever we get to that point and those things are offered, that we take advantage of those so that we can continue growing in the faith and perhaps even begin to realize and acknowledge exactly what God's will is for our lives. Now, just, just that question alone, we could go on and on and on. But I do want to talk specifically here in Colossians about a specific will that God has for us, and that is knowledge. The knowledge of wisdom and how important that is 
in our day and age, okay? We need, to, we, need to under, we need to understand that. But by getting into the Word, new believers, all believers, can begin to discover what God's plans are for their lives. It's more than just existing God has a purpose, I believe, for each and every one of our lives, a specific calling upon each and every one of our lives. And it's up to us to be in his word, seeking his will, that we might discover those things. The scripture we're in this morning, like I said, makes it clear, explains it very simply, that this is God's intention for us, that we discover what his will is for us. So I want to look in the, at this morning more particularly in the realm uh, of an all-important knowledge that we need to have. If you've got your Bibles, let's go ahead and go to Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to begin with verse 1 there. Paul is sharing with the Colossi church. Uh, once again, as, as Paul has done time and time again, uh, he's, he is dealing with hypocrisy. Uh, within the church, uh, false teachings, and that's kind of what we find going on here. It's basically, it's called, it's a Greek word, uh, Gnosticism, all knowledge or all knowing. Uh, these Christians, the church were being uh, infiltrated by such things as uh, paganism, uh, philosophies, uh, Judaism, Greek thought, right along with the Christian church. They're mixing all of these together and they're allowing themselves to be led astray. So this is what Paul is, is uh, dealing with early on here in, in Colossians. How many of you know somebody, that, and you don't doubt, you don't doubt for one moment that they are a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, but how many people do you know that when it comes to the gospel and, 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 and religion, uh, they take a little from here and a little from there. And a little, any, you, anybody know anybody like that? Yeah, I've, I've, I've had some friends down the road. They, they might stick, you know, with the truth in, in, on one point, but then they'll fly off the handle. But so-and-so said this, so I agree with this. And they're just all over the place and not really grounded where, where they need to be. And the only truth that we're going to find, the certain truth, is in God's word. Amen? That's the only place we're going to find a certain truth. Let's take a look at this. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. The faith and the love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing, uh, um, doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying and, for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." So verse 9 is really a, a key verse that I kind of want to, that I kind of came off of for the message that I want to share with you uh, today. Like I said, in Colossians chapter 1, 1 through 13, makes it very clear, Paul makes it very clear what God's intentions are for us concerning his will. It describes very clearly what God wants for us. And first and foremost, and I believe it has to begin here, is a knowledge of his will. God, what do you want for my life? How many of you have ever asked, God, what is your will for me? I bet we all have one time or another. God, what is your will for me? because we earnestly desire to know what that will is so that we can begin implementing that and blessing the lives of others and being instrumental in the kingdom once we find that out. The knowledge of your will. Two part, 
what he wants from us, all right, what he wants from us and what he wants for us. Two very key issues that I want to take a look at. But every day of our lives are to be lived for him. As I said in the very beginning, every day of our life is to be lived for him instead of just existing, all right? Instead of just existing, instead of just resting in our salvation, there is a specific call upon each and every one of our lives. There's more than just going through the motions of our baptism and attending church and living life as we please. Devin talked about that. Paul said, no way, no way are we to go back to the life that we have been rescued from. The Apostle Paul in Romans and Corinthians reminds us that we are individuals. And he reminds us in both of those, in both of those books that we have different personalities, abilities, opportunities. And as such, because of those, God has specific plans and directions for each and every one of our lives. There's not one of us here, brother and sister, can make any kind of excuse claiming that we don't have the right background in order to fulfill God's desires for us. You know, I didn't want to take the time, but I almost listed all of the people <laughs> that God chose in their backgrounds because God chose some people you and I would not have given a second chance. Amen? But he chose those individuals to carry out his will. So you and I have no excuse whatsoever but to be obedient jesus knew us and in the very beginning he designed his plans for our lives for our lives i want to take a look at a couple passages uh go to jeremiah if you would for one of them jeremiah chapter one i just want to look at verse five there jeremiah chapter one verse five and then we'll go ahead and go back a little further to to Psalm 139, but Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Let's back up to verse 4 there. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, this he comes to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, what happened? I set you apart. Think about that. Think about that. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And that is just as relevant for you and I today. Go ahead and turn back even further to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, 13 through 16. And this is David. And notice what he has to say. Psalm 139 beginning with verse 13. David writes, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That word ordained means put in order. Put in order. All the days were put in order, were written in your book before, before they even came to be. That's how mindful God was of us before we even came into this world. He knew us and he had specific plans and a purpose for our lives. And sometimes we're a little slow to acknowledge that, and sometimes we're a little slow even when we do acknowledge God's will <laughs> to begin walking in that will as well, too. I've known people that are like that as well. There are at least three aspects or three parts of God's will, and you've got that in your outline. I realize the outline is a little bit busy, and I thank Linda for being able to put all that there, and hopefully you're able to make that out. But there are three aspects of God's will that I want to share with you this morning. The first one is his predestined will. If you're writing that in, his predestined will for our lives. And that is God's overriding sovereign will for each and every one of us that he continues to implement in the world today, all right? These things are irresistible, they are unchangeable, and they are unconditional because they have been ordained by God. And I was thinking about what, what would be a good example of predestined the crucifixion of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary the death of Jesus 
was predestined before the creation of the world. So what does that word predestined mean? It means predetermined. Predetermined. It was determined in advance, praise God, that before the creation of the world, that our Heavenly Father, because of His love, would one day give His Son to die on a cruel cross for each and every one of us. Be God's moral will for our lives. God's moral will for our lives. And these are God's moral standards on how we ought to live as brothers and sisters in Christ. We find them explained there in Exodus chapter 21 through 17, which are the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. Amen? They are still viable today. But what we know about the Ten Commandments in, in Exodus, they were expanded or enlarged, all right, in the New Testament. And one such passage that I want to take a look at is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you would turn there, verses 1 through 5. And these few verses talk about the believer's sanctification or being set apart. But I believe as I read this from, from 1 Thessalonians, you'll see some similarities between what Paul is talking about there versus what we find concerning the, the Ten Commandments in Exodus. So let's take a look at this here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 through 5. And it's all about living to please God. He says, finally, brothers, we instruct you, how, instruct you how to live in order to please God. That's what the Ten Commandments were all about at one time, as in, in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, there again, set apart, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And in that, uh, in, and in that, in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all of such Sins. I added one more verse there. But go back sometime and take a look at Exodus 21 through 17. And it lists there the Ten, ten Commandments. But you'll notice the similarities of what Paul just said in the text that I just shared with you. And see, there's God, God's desired will. God's desired will for our lives. All right? And this encompasses his will for his people, including our salvation, such as our baptism, our Christian service, our prayer life, wise decision-making, and a character, a godly character that displays the fruit of the Spirit that we find in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. All right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of those, that fruit is to be a makeup of our life. Number two on your outline, I put that in the form of a question. How, excuse me, why should we seek to know and obey God's will? Why should we seek to know and obey God's will? And this is why. Because as Christians, we are responsible to live by his will. Amen? Because as Christians, we are responsible to live by his will, especially in light of his return. I want us to take a look at 2 Peter, if you would. Chapter 3. It's a little bit lengthy, but I want to share this. 2 Peter, chapter 3, beginning with verse 1 and following. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord... 
A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, right along with what Devin shared with us, what kind of people are you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteousness. Amen, church? Amen? So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. You'll notice that Peter also mentions what Paul mentioned in Colossians about the knowledge and the importance of the knowledge. Let, let, let me say something I didn't say in the beginning. The knowledge is not just about the accumulation of knowledge for knowledge's sake. The whole intention of the message and what Paul said in Colossae is that that knowledge that we receive and that we long for is to be lived out. Amen? Is to be lived out in our lives because that's the only way we're going to continue to be obedient to God's word and God's will for our life. And living as Peter has directed us to live in light of the Lord's return. There's a lot of people out there who have a head full of knowledge, but they've never given their heart to Jesus Christ. Amen? They've never given their heart to Jesus Christ. And we need to keep those individuals in, in our prayers. But that is the way we need to conduct ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, I've got that written there. You don't have to look that up, but I want to go ahead and read that here. 2 Corinthians 5.10, and this is in light of what I was sharing there from 2 Peter, uh, the importance of being mindful of the lives that we live. And this is one of those purposes why. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. It's not a condemning, all right? But it's, it, but it's just taking a look at our lives, Christians. Have we been faithful to our Lord's call? And then there is one in Romans that I've got mentioned in your outline that I want to share with you. Romans 14, 11, and 12. Once again, the Apostle Paul says, It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess to God. Verse 12, So then each will give an account of himself to God. There will be a time, even Christians, not for judgment, not for condemnation, but we'll give an account of the lives that we lived in the body, whether good or bad. So it's very, very important that we continue to strive to be obedient to God's word and God's will in every area of our life. The main task that is before us as Christians is to remain faithful and obedient with what? with our time, with our treasure, with our talents, with our abilities, with our opportunities, and get this, even in the hardships of life. Because that's where the rubber hits the road. Amen? Whenever we are faithful and people see that we are remaining faithful, even in the hardships of life, what a wonderful testimony that is. It's easy to be upbeat and, 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 and to be excited and, and, and to be able to share when things are going well. But the greatest example of our faith and our trust in the Lord is when those difficult times come our way. And what an example those things can be to others. Number three in your outline. We can all begin to live God's will today. And, and I, I, I presented it that way assuming 
maybe somebody isn't. Now, I hope and pray that's not the case for anybody, but I want us to know something. Maybe we're not living according to God's will today. Maybe there's some area of our life where we've not given over to him. So wherever you're at in your life, this is the day of beginning. Amen? Wherever you are, whether you're a born-again believer or you have yet to receive Jesus Christ, this day you are here for a specific purpose, and it's an opportunity once again to take a look at your life. Where are you at? Do you belong to him? Do you not belong to him? If you belong to him but you're not living according to his will, we can begin walking in that will today. If you've yet to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is your day of opportunity too. But in both cases, the Lord has promised to take us right where we are and begin guiding us once again in his desired will for each and every one of our lives. This has always been his desire, always been his desire for each and every one of us. Colossians 1, 9, that we may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. You know what? It's amazing what God can do with a life that's totally surrendered to him. Can I get an amen? How, how, many, how many of you know somebody, maybe you grew up with them and you're thinking, this guy, this person's never going to come to the Lord. Anybody know What's going through your mind whenever they come to the Lord? <laughs> right, Dave? It's like, I never would have thunked it, <laughs> okay? But I tell you what, when the gospel, when the good news to come somebody and lands on their heart, I don't care where they're at in their life. Remember that song, The Vilest Offender Who Truly Believes. Now, I don't want to go on with that song because it goes against our doctrine, okay? Because it goes on to say that moment from Jesus, all right, apart and receives. There's more to that. But the vilest offender, I don't care what somebody's done in their life, if they are willing, if they are willing to give themselves over the Christ, miracles can happen. Amen, church? Miracles can happen in that person's life. Even though our past cannot be changed. I heard a preacher one time say, we cannot go back and unscramble eggs. Amen? <laughs> what has happened in the past has happened. But because of genuine repentance, genuine repentance, 1 John 1, 9, God will take us right where we are. He'll take us right where we are and begin living in us and through us once again. You know, even, even those who continue for some reason to hate God and reject his son, the opportunity is there. As I shared with you from 2 Peter 3, 9, God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Amen? Everyone to come to repentance. I got thinking about this. Let's take a look. Uh, um, think about this for a moment. How about Saul of Tarsus before he became Paul? A persecutor of the church. One day on the road to Damascus, he was struck down blind. You remember that? Over there in Acts chapter 9. And God worked on that man's life and became a great disciple. Thirteen books of the New Testament that Paul wrote that we have before us. I jotted this down because I believe in my heart of hearts that it's true. And I hope you do too. No one is so evil that God cannot save him if he is willing to turn to Jesus in faith. Can I get an amen? Amen. No one is so evil. Fourthly, and we're getting there, be patient with me. God delights in showing us his will. God delights in showing us his will. And I've got those written out for you, and I'll just take a moment to read those. Psalm 1611, both of these persons are from David. Psalm 1611 says, You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 32, 8, David wrote, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, says God. I will counsel you and watch over you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Did anybody notice anything on front of their bulletin? Probably. All right. We probably know this one better. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. How many still struggle to do that sometimes? A lot of us probably. All right. Number five. What hinders us from doing God's will? 
I went ahead and wrote them out and had Linda go ahead and type these up for time's sake. But I want to take a look. They're pretty self-explainable, but as we get close to ending this message, I want us to give consideration to the hindrances of life. Self-will. And I shared that before a couple of messages ago. This is people who want their own way. No one's going to tell me what to do, so that mindset continues to hinder them from God's will. And we find that, that attitude sometimes even in some Christians. Self-will. We want our way. The influence of others. We listen to them rather than listening to God. Maybe that's happened before in your life. Ignorance of God's word. We don't know his promises. We don't know what the word of God says. That it might direct our paths. Doubt. We question God's ability to work in and through us for whatever the reason might be. And these two I want to lump together, and I, and I kind of call them the Moses complex. Okay? The Moses complex. Because you remember when God came to him in the burning bush, he said, I want you to go to Pharaoh and, and tell Pharaoh to let my children go. Remember how many excuses the guy made? Until finally got, God got upset there. But I call this the Moses complex. Feelings of unworthiness. We begin to question whether or not God can truly use us. Can God truly use us? And that next one is fear. We even question our own ability, just like Moses. Who am I? I, I can't speak. I mean, who am I? And then lastly, and this one can lead to eternal destruction for all eternity. Willful known sin that we don't want to change. You know, I thank you, Devin, for that because I, I don't understand and I cannot see risking one's salvation for some pleasure <laughs> on this side of life. It's like I said before, we walk in, Lord, you can have every room in the house but this closet. Because for some reason, there's something in that closet that keeps us coming back and not surrendering our all to him. That, that, that little closet, that little closet can have some eternal ramifications, can it not? If we don't clean that closet and give that closet to the Lord, that can have some eternal eternal possibilities as a praise team comes forward this morning so I want to ask you a question what is hindering you from living according to God's will maybe it's one of the things that we took a look at maybe it's something else and I'm just and that's just assuming if there is something that is hindering you what is it and once you have acknowledged it, are you willing to submit to Christ and turn that little corner of the house or that little closet over to him and allow him to begin working in your life to the fullness and goodness, his perfect will that he desires for your life? Because that is what he desires. I've ran into people like this. Maybe you have. Maybe there's somebody here this morning. I have talked to people before. And believe it or not, my oldest sister, who is younger than I, even said this when we were talking. I was trying to share with her uh, about coming back to church and coming to the Lord. She, she gave her life to the Lord years and years ago. But uh, you know, like a lot of people do, they kind of kind of stray away and got into a lot of things she didn't need to be into. And, and she told me, she said, Kevin, you don't know. You don't know the life that I lived. How can God forgive me? I think grace was mentioned here this morning, too, in what Devin said. And I don't know about you, but I truly believe that there is a grace that is greater than all our sins. Can I get an amen? A grace that is greater than all of our sins. Maybe you look at your life and you said, you know what? I've messed up too much. There's no way God can forgive me. You're covered by grace. Jesus loves you. If you have that opportunity to make a decision, today is a day that he has made the stand. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me Oh, his 
Everyone said, Amen. Amen. In my Father's house, there's a place for each and every one of us. John 14, He's preparing for us. Let's all be there together. Amen. Let's all be there together. Jesse, you have our closing prayer, brother. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity and the freedom we have to gather in your house, sing praises to your name, gather around your table, and hear your message. We thank you, Father, for this message Kevin gave us. We Pray, Father, that we can apply this to our hearts and our lives, Father. Help us to go out to the community and share the gospel with those that don't know you. Give a safe passage to our separate homes. Be with Greg and Brenda as they make their way home. And, Father, we just thank you so much for your son. And in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And together we see. you have a good week.